we've brought as our special guest today, Kermit Zarley. I, I first met Kermit in, back in Arizona uh, at the Lakeshore Bible Church. And uh, I just appreciated his story and his testimony. And I don't want to give a lot of background because I think he's going to be sharing uh, just his journey uh, to, to this belief of faith. But it's been a real joy to, to share time with, with Kermit. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to what you will be sharing with us today. So Kermit, go ahead and come on up and, okay. and we will get started. Well, it's good to be with you folks. I came from Arizona. <laughs> and Texas doesn't look the same to me as it used to. I lived here 40 years. I used to come to Austin. I don't recognize that place anymore. Huh. Well, uh, I thought this first time of my speaking here, I'd just share my story of how I came to know the Lord and then entered into a, what I call my quest for the real Jesus. I was born in Seattle, Washington, and I didn't come from a religious home, but both of my parents had come from church-going families and had respect for Christians, and I had an uncle who was a Nazarene pastor, and he started pastoring a Nazarene church in West Seattle that was about a mile from my house and I started going to Sunday school when I was five years old and just grew up going to Sunday school. And then uh, I had a Sunday school teacher who was a student at the University of Washington who became our Sunday school teacher and he had us memorize 10 verses in the New Testament. And <clears throat> I, uh, I asked him about this Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace are we saved through faith, not of ourselves, not of works. And uh, I said, I thought that you were a Christian just by trying to be good. And he said, no, then Jesus wouldn't have had to die on the cross for our sins. And he said, how about staying after uh, Sunday school and we'll talk about it some more. So we did, just him and I, and he led me in a prayer to receive Jesus into my heart, and I believe I was born again. So we soon moved away from uh, that area, and I wasn't going to Sunday school anymore. Um, I was into golf. I uh, started when I was 10 years old, and my dad had was in the restaurant business, and he'd taken a, a concessions at the West Seattle Golf Course, and that's how he got started in golf, and that's how I got started. And then I attained some success in junior golf and got some recognition by Coach Day Williams at the University of Houston, who was the coach of the men's golf team. And I was offered a part-time scholarship to go to school there and they had won the NC2A team championship four years in a row. And I knew this was the place to go if I wanted to try to become a professional golfer on the PGA Tour, which I did uh, want to do that. So I went to school there. Um, I started going to uh, an independent Bible church because some of my friends did, some of the guys on the golf team, and the name of that church is Baraka Church. Uh, if you know anything about Houston, uh, the Galleria, this big shopping center, uh, Baraka Church is right next to it. And uh, then I got involved in Campus Crusade for Christ and was uh, invited to attend a college retreat at Camp Penile, not very far from here. Does anybody here know about Camp Penile? No. 
Uh, well, it was started back uh, after the Second World War by Gordon Whitelock, who had a connection to a church that, uh, after I left Brackett Church years later, and uh, but at any rate, Camp Penile is a place where uh, churches have uh, had a lot of different activities. Uh, it's near Austin. Uh, kids would have camps there, and uh, it was a good Christian ministry. So I attended this uh, Campus Crusade for Christ retreat on a weekend that was about the semester break of the freshman, my freshman year. And the key, two keynote speakers were the pastor of the church where I was attending. His name was Bob Thiem. And uh, a uh, member of the church uh, who had been a student at the University of Houston, his name was Hal Lindsey. And uh, so Hal was becoming a popular speaker on uh, college campuses representing Campus Crusade for Christ. Uh, ten years later, he wrote his first book. Uh, he had some help on that, and that book is entitled The Late Great Planet Earth. No book had ever uh, sold even near a million copies that had been about Christian eschatology, which that book was. <clears throat> and uh, it wasn't very long until that book was selling in the tens of millions of copies. Uh, Time Magazine uh, selected that book as the book of the decade at the end of the 1970s. So Hal spoke on a subject on uh, Bible prophecy. It was Israel having become a state again after over 1,700 years. And, uh, and of course, that happened in 1947 or uh, 48. Uh, and uh, 48. Uh, and so <clears throat> it just really intrigued me what he was saying, you know, that these uh, prophecies in the Bible, especially in Ezekiel 38, uh, about it, Jews were going to move back after this diaspora that had been caused by the Roman Empire, you know. There were two revolts of Israel in 70 A.D. and 132 A.D., those are called the first uh, Jewish revolt and the second Jewish revolt. When the second one happened, the Roman Empire threw the Jews out. And this uh, begins the big diaspora. And so I just thought it was amazing that uh, after all those years that Israel had become a state again and the Bible had prophesied that. And so that just really interested me. And uh, that night after Hal spoke, uh, something happened that was really kind of astonishing. Uh, it wasn't planned. Uh, 10 college kids, guys, got in a group, chairs around a circle. Uh, there were two, uh, I call them Christian workers, who were involved with us. And one of them was my friend Jim Hiskey, who was the regional director of Campus Crusade in Houston at the University of Houston and Rice University at the time. And he had been an All-American golfer at the University of Houston for three years. And he went on the PGA Tour and decided that wasn't for him, went with Bill uh, Bright and his Campus Crusade for Christ went on his staff. And so Jim was on a new staff member at the University of Houston and Rice uh, campuses when I came to school in 1959. So Jim became my friend. So here we were in this group, us 12 guys, and it was an all-night prayer vigil. I asked Jim about a couple of years ago, have you ever had an all-night 
prayer vigil again after that one we had in January 1960. And he said no. And it's been the same with me. I've never been in that before. Uh, I mean, since. And so it went all night. We were praying. And as we got toward the end, uh, somebody said, well, why don't we pray that God, uh, uh, that we make a promise to God <laughs> about how we were going to serve him in our lives. And it was just going around in the circle, each guy praying and saying something about this. And it came to me, and I didn't know what I was going to do. This was the first time I had ever prayed with people before. And so it came to me, and I promised God that I was going to be a serious student of Bible prophecy for the rest of my life. And I'd just gotten interested in it just a few hours ago. <laughs> well, guess what? I have nine books published, and half of them are on Bible prophecy. So that came true. And so I've specialized in my life in studying Bible prophecy. And uh, I'm writing a series on it, which I'll talk more about that tomorrow. But um, I, uh, my, uh, my golf career, I, I won the NC2A Individual Championship in 1962, led my team to the, uh, to the title. And uh, then uh, I graduated in 1963 with a business degree. Uh, I, uh, <clears throat> I was a dispensationalist. Uh, what's that? <laughs> well, uh, dispensationalism is a systematic theology. You know, there, there are not very many uh, major systematic theologies that are held in the Christian church. The main one would be covenant theology, probably the main one. Dispensationalism come up real strong in especially the last hundred years. Uh, dispensationalism was started by the Plymouth Brethren in about 19, well, the Plymouth Brethren started in about 1925 in uh, Plymouth, England, and they were uh, a group. They, they did not intend to start a church in the beginning. They just wanted to gather together around the Lord's table and recognize each other as in Christ if they just believed in Jesus' uh, death, atoning death on the cross, his resurrection, and so forth. And they wanted to kind of de-emphasize the thing about, oh, you've got to be a Baptist or a Lutheran or all of this sort of thing. And that's the way they started. Uh, but eventually, they did kind of become a, a denomination. And uh, there, were, there was one person named John Nelson Darby, who was one of the main teachers. And he started teaching this uh, rapture of the church before the tribulation. So the Plymouth Brethren were into Christian eschatology a lot, Bible prophecy, end times. And he started teaching this in 1830. Uh, actually, he'd been invited into the group by his friend, uh, Benjamin Wills Newton, B.W. Newton. And both of them had been uh, attending uh, University of Oxford, and then they decided they didn't think that was God's will for their life, and they quit. Uh, but Newton eventually began to object to Darby's pre-tribulationism. And Darby was developing a whole system of theology around this rapture of the church before the seven-year tribulation, and then Jesus returns to the earth at the end of the seven-year tribulation. And that um, system that Darby was developing came to be called dispensationalism. So at Baraka Church, I was taught dispensational theology. 
uh, the school in the United States that is most known for dispensationalism is Dallas Theological Seminary. Uh, I was a Trinitarian for 22 years. And then in 1980, I had a moment of enlightenment, I believe. I was in my study in my house. Uh, I was reading Jesus Olivet Discourse. And uh, that is, of course, in all three synoptics. You know, the first three Gospels of the New Testament are called synoptics. And uh, Matthew and Mark record that Olivet Discourse of Jesus quite similarly in Matthew 24 and Mark 13. And so I came to this uh, passage uh, in which Jesus is speaking to his apostles and uh, he's saying of his second coming, which he's been teaching about, uh, no man knows the day or the hour not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, referring to himself, but only the Father. Now, I got to give you some background about this. <clears throat> the church started to think that Jesus was God in the second century, but they didn't believe that Jesus was equal in divinity to God the Father. They thought he was of a lesser divinity. And those people are called apologists, the ones who wrote books and were the main teachers of the Catholic Church that was developing. And so that went on in the second and third century. And then uh, there, there came about an uproar in the Roman Empire, which was becoming uh, full of a lot of Christians. And the uproar started in Egypt, and a man named Arius was teaching that Jesus preexisted. But there was a time before his incarnation, when he became a human being, there was a time before that when the Logos did not exist. Now, why did I say Logos? Well, the, the apologists had taught that this pre-existence of Jesus was the Logos. That is translated word in English, the word of God. Uh, so Jesus pre-existed as the word, the Logos. Uh, many of them, like Arius, said, oh, it's not only the Logos, it's the Son also. So Jesus divinity uh, is, uh, his sonship is considered to be his divinity. And so they joined the Logos and the Son together and called it the Logos Son. So Arius said there was a time in eternity past when the Logos Son did not exist and God brought it into existence. And then sometime after that, God created the universe through the Logos Son. Now, uh, his uh, bishop, Alexander, uh, in the Alexandria diocese, which was the third largest diocese in the Roman Empire, Catholic diocese, uh, Bishop Alexander objected to what Arius was teaching. And he said, no, the Logos Son always did exist. And so that little difference right there became a huge, big argument. And it was upsetting the Roman Empire as far as the emperor was concerned, and that's Constantine. Constantine had become a professing Christian in the year 313. It happened because of a battle. Uh, he and Maximus uh, were going to battle leading 
two different uh, militaries. And Constantine claims that he saw up in the sky a vision, and uh, he saw a cross, and underneath it, it said, in this conquer. And so he believes that was a divine revelation. His mother was a Christian. And so he went forth and won the battle. And uh, oh, incidentally, the uh, vision said, uh, take off those uh, uh, images on your soldiers' shields, which would be images of Roman gods. And so he did that and then went forth, won the battle, declared himself a Christian. And now, 12 years later, his empire is in uproar. And he says, we got to have a big conference. And uh, so it was called the Nicene Council because it was held in Nicaea, which today is in what we call Turkey. And they met for about it was quite a long time, many weeks. And the emperor was kind of putting pressure on the, uh, let's see, how many bishops was it? Do you remember anybody, how many bishops that was? 318. 318 bishops from around the Roman Empire. And they usually had half a dozen assistants who came with them. So it was a big affair. They held it in the emperor's a uh, big palace and, you know, beautiful buildings. And this was all new to Christianity because Christians had been persecuted a lot in their history. And all of a sudden now the Roman Empire, Emperor is a Christian. And, you know, they were just in seventh heaven. <laughs> and so, but the emperor put a little pressure on him. He said, I want this solved. Uh, create a document, and this is what everybody's supposed to believe. So they did. It was called the Nicene Creed, and in the creed it says Jesus is very God of very God. That means that he was just as much God as the one who we call the Father, who Jesus, of course, taught us to do that, to call God our Father. And so... Uh, this now, for the first time, uh, the Catholic Church uh, has made it official that Jesus is not just of a lower divinity compared to God the Father. He is of an equal divinity, uh, co-equal and co-eternal. Uh, and now, there was no doctrine of the Trinity at this time. And this comes along later. The three Cappadocians begin to write treatises on the nature of the Holy Spirit. That was in the 370s. And in 381, a new emperor calls another council, uh, Constantinople, and uh, a creed is produced, which is basically a Nicene Creed, but altered somewhat so that the doctrine of the Trinity is in there but they don't use the word Trinity. And the reason they don't use the word Trinity is because it's not in the gathered sacred books, which at that time, uh, you know, there was still no really recognized New Testament, but there were these books that they were recognizing as sacred. And it wasn't, uh, uh, actually, I think it was in 395 or 6, when uh, they had the first, uh, let's see, it wouldn't be a, would it be a council where they recognize all the books of the New Testament that we know. And so, <clears throat> so no, there wasn't the word Trinity in that, and that's why they didn't put in the creed, uh, and because the, a lot of people objected to that. Uh, that word's not in the, uh, our scriptures or our holy books. And so, anyway, but that is the history. And it was the doctrine of Trinity, and that's what the church taught ever since. And so I didn't say that on the end of the Nicene Council, uh, one-third of the uh, Nicene Council's creed, on the uh, 
end of the creed, one third of it, is all anathemas against people who don't accept that Jesus is very God and very God. So this is the history. And to, uh, to oppose that, uh, you know, you were ostracized. You weren't considered a Christian. Uh, and so I knew something about that during these 22 years that I was a, a uh, Trinitarian. Um, but there was still a lot that I didn't know. But here I was reading this text in the uh, Jesus All the Discourse in which he says he doesn't know. And uh, what I wanted to say was there was other councils after those two. And the fifth one, uh, that was called the, the uh, Cal Council of Chalcedon. They were usually named after the place where they were held. And so the, at the, the Council of Chalcedon was held because the church had been struggling with the question, how can Jesus be a man but also be God? How does that happen? So it was at Chalcedon that they made it official uh, that Jesus has two natures uh, not mixed up with each other, and that is a human nature and divine nature. And that's called the hypostatic union of Christ. So here I am reading this text in Jesus' all the discourse, and I have all this information in my head. The doctrine of the Trinity, Jesus is just as much God as the Father is God. And how is that? It's because of the hypostatic union. He has two natures, human nature, divine nature. And whenever Jesus did or said something that is recorded in the four Gospels of the New Testament, I was taught, and lots of people have been taught, that Jesus did that or he said that in one of his natures, either his divine nature or his human nature. And for me, I was taught that when Jesus said he didn't know the time of his return, he said that in his human nature. He did know it in his divine nature because he's God. And so here I am reading this, and I, all of a sudden I thought to myself, that makes Jesus look like a liar. He says he doesn't know the time of his return, but he really does because he has to know it in his divine nature. He knows just as much as God the Father knows. And I said to myself, sometimes I can talk out loud to myself. And so I said out loud to myself, that makes Jesus look like a liar. And then I thought about it a while, and then I said, shook my head, and I said, I will stand on the integrity of Jesus. I must look into this. Now, that was an understatement. That, um, <clears throat> that was in 1980. So I start to study this. And in 1982, I'm playing on the PGA Tour in the US Open at Pebble Beach in California, my favorite golf course on the tour. 10 years prior, the tournament had been held there and I had a chance to win it. That was my great goal of all my life, to win the US Open. And I was leading the tournament on the last round. And Jack Nicklaus was one stroke behind me on the, the sixth and the seventh hole. And on the seventh hole, this little dinky par three uh, you shoot from up on a, uh, up and you shoot down to the green. It's just a little shot. And I hit it down there on the green, put it up about a, less than 18 inches from the hole, and there was a great big spike mark right in my line. See, in those days, we had metal spikes on the bottom of our shoe, golf shoes. 
Nowadays, they got it changed all around. You know, they don't wear those spikes anymore. Not only that, you can tap down any marks on the green. They never allowed you to do that in my day. And so I couldn't fix that. Big old spike mark pulled up right my way. And I hit the putt, it hit the spike mark, boom, pushed it way off, I missed the putt. And I went to the next hole and, you know, I was upset. Went to the next hole and three putted from only about 15 feet. And then made a double bogey two hills later. Made a triple bogey on 14. My dad flew down from Yakima, Washington to see me on the last round. And he told me when the round was over, when you made that eight, on the 14th hole, I turned green. He said, you spent more money in just two minutes than I make in a whole year. <laughs> and so, so anyway, here I am back at Pebble Beach again, 10 years later. So I'm so excited to play in the tournament that I, you know, I had a chance to win it. And I'm staying at a private home. They, it's Christians, I don't, didn't usually do that. Jim Hiskey actually told me about the people and said, would you like to stay out there? And I said, okay. And there was a theological library in the bedroom where I was sleeping. And here I am into this subject of, is Jesus God or not? And so now I got my own little theological, and, Lewis Berry Schaefer's theology is there, eight volumes. He was the founder of Dallas Theological Seminary. I'm into all of these books, reading them. And when I get home from the, get back from the playing my round each uh, day, and Saturday night I'm staying up way past midnight. Should have gone to bed, and. <laughs> And uh, I'm wrestling with this, and I'm praying and everything, and finally I decided. I made my decision. The Bible does not say Jesus is God. But I had what I call two barriers, and that was two verses of Scripture that I, I had no answer for. And that seemed to say, Jesus is God. And those are the two main scriptures that the scholars who write on this subject, you know, top distinguished scholars who have written on this, those are the two main scriptures that say Jesus is God. And that is John 1, 1, C. John 1, 1. Uh, if you recall, uh, in the English Bible, is, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so now, with this background I told you about, about the Logos Son, the Word being Jesus, you understand that the Logos, the Word, that is spoken of in this verse is referring to this pre-existence of Jesus. Whatever this pre-existence is, that's the Logos. And so when it says, and the Logos was God, it seems to say, well, and then you drop down a little later in verse 14, uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. What does that mean? Well, that's what they call the incarnation. That's when Jesus became a human being. And so <clears throat> putting the two together, verse 1 and 14, it looks like this book, the Gospel of John, is saying Jesus is God. Okay, the second barrier for me is in the same book, and that is about the Apostle Thomas. Maybe you recall. Jesus appeared to the first gathering of his disciples after his resurrection on Sunday night. Raised Sunday morning, 
pierced them Sunday night. They're gathered in a room, which I believe was the upper room, where they had uh, eaten the Passover, and <clears throat> locked doors because of fear of the Jews, and Jesus appears. But Thomas is not there. And so the disciples are telling Thomas, we've seen the Lord. He came and was there. And Thomas said, I won't believe it unless I can put my fingers through the nail prints in his hands and my fist through the hole in his chest. And one week later, they gather again. And Jesus appears again. But this time, Thomas is with him. And so Jesus right away says to Thomas, uh, let's see, I can't, believe, I can't remember now exact words, but uh, Thomas responds, or he said something about believing. Uh, Greg, do you, can you quote that verse? Uh, see, you now believe. Yeah. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. There you go. And so Thomas responds, and he says, my Lord and my God. So it looks like Thomas is calling Jesus his God. And so those were the two barriers. So I went about five years, from 1982 to about 1987. And then I got my answers to those for my satisfaction. Uh, I was at Dallas Seminary studying this subject, and I knew the librarian Marvin Hunt. So I went and asked Marvin, in trepidation, frankly, because I'm considering giving up my teaching of the Trinity. And that means all my friends are not going to accept me as a Christian, which has been, had been going on. And so I asked Marvin, do you know of any reputable scholar that has written on John 1-1-C and says... That should not be translated, and the word was God. Doesn't mean that. And he says, yes. And uh, now I'm trying to think of the guy's name. It's uh, Paul, uh, boy, I can't think of it now. Uh, but anyway, I went and read his article, lengthy article in the, the, uh, the best theological journal, which is the Journal of uh, Biblical Literature. And uh, although I didn't know Greek at the time, I took Greek after that, uh, I became kind of convinced that he was right. And uh, he says, he approves of the translation of the New English Bible. And that translates it, what God was, the word was. Now, it has to do with complex things for us that don't know Greek real well, uh, although maybe there's some here that do. Uh, but the theos is an arthritis. Doesn't have the article, but it had the article before. Uh, there's just a lot of things about it. And so that was satisfactory to me. I felt like I got my answer on that question. And so um, I view the Gospel of John as uh, that first verse is a mini prologue to the rest of the book. And the first 18 verses are the big prologue to the rest of the book. And so if you just think of the mini prologue, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and what God was, the Word was, and you look through the rest of the book, you'll see that each one of those are pointing to certain places in the book. Like when Jesus, Jesus at the Last Supper is going to leave and he tells his disciples that and uh, he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, and then he says, if you see me, you've seen the Father. He doesn't mean he's the Father. And so he means the Father's in him. And that's what I think that uh, the author of the Gospel of John meant when he is recording Thomas's confession there. And the way I came up on this was I was reading 
uh, Rudolf Boltman's commentary on the Gospel of John. Now, Rudolf Boltman was considered by a lot of people to be the greatest New Testament scholar in the 20th century. Uh, he was German, and the center of Christian theology used to be in Rome at the Vatican and in Germany. Uh, and that's for a long time after the Reformation. Uh, the center of Christian theology, Protestant theology, was Germany. Uh, but German scholars had been getting pretty liberal. And uh, so Boltman didn't believe in the resurrection. Uh, there are some good things to say about Rudolf Boltman, I think, but some that it's hard for me to accept a person who claims to be a Christian if they, if they don't believe Jesus died for their sins on the cross. That's hard for me to accept a person uh, as a Christian. I think that's the, the number one most important thing of the gospel of Christ. Jesus died for our sin. And the second thing is that God raised him from the dead to prove it. And so, you know, a lot of these liberal scholars don't believe in the resurrection. Well, anyway, Boltman connected Jesus, uh, Thomas's confession with what Jesus had taught the disciples only about seven days earlier or something, uh, that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And what he meant was, God is in me. This scholars call the mutual indwelling. Jesus is in the Father, the Father's in Jesus. And so, Bowman didn't make anything out of that. And I thought, wow, what a connection. I think that is exactly what Thomas meant. He sees God in Jesus. He sees Jesus has been raised from the dead. He's seeing the healed wounds in his chest and his wrists and his feet. And he realizes that God has raised Jesus and that God is in Jesus. That's what I think Thomas meant. And so for me, my two barriers were gone. I was totally satisfied that no, the Bible does not teach Jesus is God. There's in any place in the Gospels where Jesus says, I am God or anything close to it. Uh, the way I, I first studied this, uh, I said, what's the most important thing to look at on this? I said, it's got to be what Jesus said about himself. I went and bought a red letter Bible. You know, that's where the four Gospels, all the sayings of Jesus are in red. And I read only the red words. And I'm looking for something in which Jesus is telling us he's God. Nothing. But now you ask a Trinitarian, they're liable to say, oh, John 10, 30. Jesus said, uh, I and the Father are one. Well, I knew that. I knew that was a key verse to support the belief that Jesus is God. And I said to myself, is that all they got? Because that's really taken out of its context to say that this one uh, indicates that they're both God because G Jesus is talking about he and the Father work together right before that. He'd already said, you know, he speaks the Father's words and so I thought that's just taking it completely out of his context. He only means the Father and I are unified together in the mission of reaching human beings. And God has given me these people, and he's keeping them uh, secure in his hand. That's what verses 28 and 29 say. So <clears throat> I just decided right then that I have no problems whatsoever with this. 
Jesus is not God, he's a man. Yes, I believe in the virgin birth. And so it looks like that's how he came to be sinless, as the New Testament tells us multiple times. And therefore was qualified to go to the cross, be the Lamb of God that would bear our sin. Um, <clears throat> and so, but there was one thing left, <laughs> and that is the so-called pre-existence of Jesus. So I still hung on to the pre-existence of Jesus. And there were lots of scriptures that seemed to support that, especially Jesus' sermon uh, about uh, the bread of life in John 6. But I eventually came to the opinion that <clears throat> when Jesus is speaking about his flesh and his blood, if we are to understand those literally, then he means eat my flesh and drink my blood uh, is something different than that. And so <clears throat> uh, I don't think that that refers to uh, him having pre-existed. And so by mid-90s, about 1994, I gave up the pre-existence of Jesus. And that whole journey, spiritual journey that I called my quest for the real Jesus, lasted 15 years. And so I believed the same way ever since. Jesus was a man. Paul calls him the second Adam. Paul calls, compares Jesus to Adam. Adam came into this world, had a supernatural uh, entry into this world like Jesus did, uh, was without sin. Adam was without sin. Uh, and so was Jesus. And so, of course, we know from the uh, first chapters of Genesis, if you understand that pretty much literally, as I do, that uh, Adam, both Adam and his wife Eve succumbed to the temptation and took of the tree and sin and death entered into the human race. Uh, but because Jesus was born of a virgin, that was not the case with him. Um, <clears throat> but uh, that has been my view ever since. I think that I read almost a uh, about a thousand books on the identity of Jesus in my search. And then I would go to all these libraries all over the place. You know, I was playing on the tour. Uh, all through the 90s, I played on the senior tour. And uh, I was going to libraries all over the country and learn about this. Harvard, I had two of my best uh, researchers were in Harvard. Uh, and so, I, uh, I worked really hard at this and was writing a book and it was published in 2008 and the title is, Was, um, <clears throat> The Restitution of Jesus Christ. And I used a pseudonym and the pseudonym was Servetus, Servetus the Evangelical. I had been an evangelical, I still call, uh, considered myself an evangelical. I still do today, even though most evangelicals reject me. No, you're not an evangelical. You're not even a Christian. <laughs> and so uh, Servetus came from Michael Servetus. He was a martyr. Uh, the Protestant reformers got him executed because he wrote two books in which he, uh, he taught against infant baptism and the doctrine of the Trinity. So they got him executed, they got the state to execute him. They burn at the stake. Michael Servetus, one of the greatest martyr stories in the history of Christianity. It was early in the Reformation. The Reformation started in 1517. That was the year, I think it was 1553. Uh, so, uh, my son and Scott McKnight, a uh, professor friend of mine, New Testament 
one of the top New Testament professors in the country, both independently said to me, I think you should publish this book anonymously. Get yourself a pseudonym. You shouldn't put your name on this. You're going to get so much rejection, blah, blah, blah. Thought about it for a while. I said, okay. So I put this on there. Nobody knew who I was. I published the book. I got a website. I started blasting it out there. And a whole bunch of people start talking about it. And nobody knows who this guy is who wrote this book. People are buying the book and looking at it, and they're getting impressed, the ones that you know, are not Trinitarians, including Anthony Buzzard. And Anthony finds out how to get a, get a hold of me, even though he doesn't know who I am. Let's see, now, how did that happen? Uh, oh, I guess it was, I had the book on the website, but I didn't put my name on the website. I can't think right now how that was. But he kept emailing me, who are you? And he's going on and on like this. And so I got a contest how to, uh, for people to guess who I am. <laughs> See, I had a marketing strategy. <laughs> and so I'm self-publishing this book, and I'm just selling through my website. And uh, so... They're guessing, and I'm putting out a clue every week. And, you know, they're not going to guess it with these first, you know, the clues I've got for the first several months. Uh, well, I also had become an inventor. I invented a thing called the Triangle Book. Uh, my patent attorney, I told him I, I, I've got to say, uh, I said, I want to publish this uh, book I've got in Triangle Book. And so I did. I published it in that. And uh, I'm trying to stay anonymous. And uh, he, he said, if you're going to continue to stay anonymous on this, it's going to cost you X number of thousand dollars about your patent application with the USPTO. I said, forget about it. So I decided to go public by giving them some real hot uh, tips, uh, clues. And I got closer and closer, and finally the last clue, if they knew anything at all about golf, they could guess it, and a whole bunch of them did. And it's going all around the internet. I, I saw 200, within something like 48 hours, when I announced who I was, 200 website said, ah, oh, it's this guy, Kermit Zara, the pro golfer. And one guy said, yeah, it's nothing but a pro golfer who nobody's heard of. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and so, so anyway, that was the end of my uh, anonymity. I continued to keep the, the pseudonym. Uh, and then I sold out 500 books in the triangle book format. And I had a whole lot of typos in that manuscript. Never was comfortable about that. And even discounted the book because of that. And some people didn't like the triangle book format. The reason was I made a horrible decision on how to arrange text. Uh, but anyway, so I decided, OK, um, Amazon has given us this Kindle Direct Publishing called KDP, all of us independent authors. I mean, I'm an independent author, even though I've been published with you know, some good publishing houses. Uh, and uh, you can self-publish on that. And they even help you market your book. They do all kinds of things. So I said, OK. So I corrected all the typos. I published it on KDP. It went live something like a week ago or more. Uh, so it's available out there. And uh, so that project is still going on. I'm going to advertise it. It's, uh, it's offered out there instead of just on my website. Uh, so I'm going to work hard at uh, 
advertising that book. I did change the title. So the title now is The Restitution with a subtitle, which is Biblical Proof Jesus is Not God. So that identifies what the book is about a lot more. And uh, so I feel pretty good about that now. Uh, my website, in case you want to go to it, is KermitZarley.com. My blog is Kermit Zarley Blog. And I've had that blog now for 10 years. Uh, but I don't know how long I've been speaking, but I think I'll finish. Is there anybody that would like to ask a question or discuss anything? Greg, I'll turn it over to you.